We're in, oh, we're in. Hi, I'm Alex Garcia, and thanks for joining us here at NTWC Live. It is a team effort between Bill Reed, Tim Smith, and I. We'd like to say thank you to a few groups that helped make this possible. It's USAA, South Padre Island Convention and Tourist Bureau, the Weather Company, and the Weather Boy. And now, here's Tim Smith. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to NTWC Live. It is the 14th day of September. We are past the historical peak of the hurricane season by just a couple of days. I have a hunch we're not done yet, but that's normal. That's the way it goes. So glad to have you all along with us today. Great program today. Tim Heller is going to join us in just a moment. Hal Needham, Dr. Hal Needham is with us. Hurricane Hal. Good morning, Dr. Hurricane Hal. Morning, everybody from beautiful Galveston, Texas. How are things in Galveston this morning? Did you take your swim already? Really great. I did not go for a swim today but you should have seen the blue clear water yesterday we had that light east wind and the water really gets out clear and blue it was a beautiful day and we've had a lot of those recently that's nice well let's hope it stays that way through the rest of the hurricane season and then we'll get to what's going on in the hurricane season then we'll get on to our guests here in just a second let me start by sharing the screen bill reed's not with us today by the way he is uh, storm chasing out in the north atlantic somewhere hopefully he'll be uh, back with us next week to talk about what's going on in the world but i'll share in the meantime this is what's going on in the atlantic right now we're watching this system that has a decent potential of becoming something in the next few days. Um, right now, it's in an invest at about midway across the Atlantic Basin with a 70% chance of developing and watching to see if there is an update to that uh, while we're on here. There usually is. There's uh, the National Hurricane Center's forecast uh, uh, basically path for that, uh, that 70% chance of development. This is just one of the looks of the models from Tropical Tidbits, and a lot of them keep it going straight west for the next three or four days. and. Many of the models turn it north after that, many keep it going west. But if you look at the intensity forecast, uh, not a whole lot there, up to you know tropical depression strength, tropical storm strength. Then they start to diverge when you get out five days, as you might expect. So things get a little bit more interesting out there. But that's the system we're watching in the Atlantic Basin right now, the thing of most interest out there. So we'll watch that. It's got a, a relatively <laughs> tough road if it gets up to tropical storm strength for a while, but then we'll see what happens after that. As far as the uh, Pacific goes, all the folks in Mexico keeping an eye on these two systems down here, uh, the one that has a 30 and 60% chance, two and five days out of developing right along the coast. This other one just kind of meandering about it out there has a decent chance of developing as well. Uh, here's something a little more interesting. You go to the other side of the Pacific Ocean and you've got the storm that I have to read the name very carefully each time to remember how to pronounce it, but uh, that's impacting uh, parts of China today. Let's go to another map and here you can see where it is. And Shanghai is right there. This is South Korea, that's North Korea, and that's uh, Typhoon uh, Noifa. Hoifa, Noifa, and the print's too small. But it's going up this direction, as you can see. But Shanghai is going to be impacted. Then you see it's got winds of 80 knots right down in here, expected to diminish as it goes across Shanghai. Half of it's over land, but still a pretty big impact on uh, on uh, the east coast of China right there uh, on the Chinese mainland. Here's a map again just to kind of show you what we're looking at. There's Shanghai. There's north of South Korea. There's Japan over there. So, um, you know, not, not a picture-perfect image there, but still, uh, and most of the stuff's out over the water, but still, if you're one of the folks in Shanghai, you're going, hey, it is tropical season. Something could be headed our way sometime soon. So that's the gist of what's going on in the tropics today. Um, unfortunately, the Atlantic side, again, just past the peak of the hurricane season. It's relatively quiet, but not completely. We'll see what the system out there does over the next few days, whether it's able to get its act together as it heads toward the Caribbean. So we'll talk more about that perhaps a little bit later on. But now let's get to our program today. And for the introduction, let's turn it over to once again, Hurricane Hal. Hey, everyone. I'm Really excited to introduce our guest this morning because we have so many broadcast meteorologists that participate with the National Tropical Weather Conference. Our guest is Tim Heller. He's an award-winning AMS certified broadcast meteorologist with decades of major market on-air experience. His on-air weather coverage earned four Emmy Award awards and multiple best weather cast awards from the Houston Press Club, the Dallas Press Club, and the Texas Associated Press. As a member of the Weather Company's field trial team, Tim was one of the first broadcast meteorologists in the country to incorporate, it, to incorporate augmented reality into his daily weathercast. Tim, really great to have you on the National Tropical Weather Conference. Uh, welcome aboard. Yeah, great to be here again. Um, I think I was on probably about a year ago, we were talking about uh, weather or the colors that we're using in our weather graphics. And I kind of want to continue that conversation a little bit and talk more about how we present the weather information, not just on air, but specifically how we're doing it 
online. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Competition is Getting Better and Smarter. And I'll tell you that the competition is not necessarily what you think it is. I want to ask you this. Where are you right now? Not where are you physically, but where are you mentally? Where are you in terms of your mobile, your on mobile, your online weather coverage strategy? Are you aware that we're losing viewership, but really haven't paid much attention to what you're doing on the mobile site? Have you developed a clear strategy or is it just something else you need to do day in, day out? Check off the box, I did the weather update. Where are you right now? Because the audience is changing and we need to be aware of it. And I'll admit, I was there. I was there when I was on the air working at ABC 13. I was doing digital updates, but not really sure what we were trying to accomplish. And that's changed a lot for me in the last few years. This is just one of the updates that I get on my phone every once in a while. Light rain starting soon. I got this a few weeks ago. I was not mowing the lawn when I got this. So I open up my radar scope, of course. And sure enough, I got a five-minute warning that I got a little cell coming my way. Hurried up, finish up the front yard, put the lawnmower away. Started to sprinkle about 1246 and about 1248, which radar scope shows here. I was getting some light rain. Did it last for 41 minutes? No, it lasted about a half hour. The storm weakened as it went overhead, but the app was accurate enough to be useful. That functionality, by the way, that de depicts when or forecasts when light rain is going to start is actually a functionality that started with dark sky. Apple bought that app and will sunset dark sky here, I believe at the end of this year, because all the functionality has now been moved over to the default weather app, which is where that alert came from but it's accurate enough to be useful. And that's true of most weather apps as well. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. MAGA did uh, national nationwide research for the weather company earlier this year. And the research shows that for non-severe weather, people prefer the mobile app almost two to one. 51% of those who responded to the survey, and it was over 600 adults who identify themselves as local news viewers, 51% said they prefer getting non-severe weather updates on a mobile app compared to 24% for local TV, 13% for the website, and 12% for social media. We're spending all this time worried about our Facebook followers and trying to tweet updates, but only a fraction of the consumers prefer social media as a non-severe weather resource. What do they prefer? The mobile app. And you might think, well, for severe weather, certainly we're going to do better than that. No. People, again, were asked, which do you prefer? They didn't say, what do you use? They said, which do you prefer? And 38% of the people said, I prefer the mobile app compared to 37% for local TV. 14% for the website, 12% for social media. So the people are saying that they prefer getting a generic update, a forecast with just an icon and a crude looking radar that really doesn't depict what's going on in my backyard, but people still said they prefer it. Why? Because it's accurate enough to be useful. For many people, we used to say that the, 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 the smartphones and the laptops and the, and the and tablets were considered a second screen. But for many people, this second screen is now their primary and preferred way of getting weather information. The good news is that TV stations have a weather app or a news app with a weather section. So we're playing in this field. And I think we can change some of these numbers, but it has to be at the very deliberate choice on our end in terms of what we're doing on the mobile apps. It has to be a, a, a firm strategy that we're employing to bring people to our app, not the default app, but our weather app, and hopefully bring them back to the live television as well. The research got into the nitty gritty and asked people, okay, what's wrong with local TV? What don't you like about it? The weaknesses of local TV weather, it's repetitive. It features information I already know. There's nothing new. Meteorologist doesn't explain what's going on. And when they do explain what's going on, I don't, I don't understand it. It's confusing. And they've got confusing maps. And some of them just said, I don't like my meteorologist. Well, we can't fix that part. But I do believe if we stop being repetitive, if we start delivering information that the viewers don't necessarily know, if we find new information and we explain things clearly and clean up some of the maps and get some of, rid of some of all those rainbow colored maps, if we clean up some of the confusion that the people will start to like us a little bit better, those that don't. So what are the strengths of local TV? What can we build on? 
were accurate, were dependable. People say that we help them plan their day, that our coverage on the air is hyper-local. We've got live radar, video, and pictures. And some of us, like some people, like their local meteorologist. But here's the problem with the strengths. The top five strengths are also the strengths of the mobile weather app, as mentioned by people who were surveyed for this. Yes, they said the mobile app is accurate. I believe it's accurate enough to be useful, and I'm a meteorologist. People said it's dependable. It helps me plan my day. It's got the hour-by-hour hour forecast right there. It's hyper-local. It's from my neighborhood. It says Bel Air at the top. It says Galveston at the top. And I can check the radar there. So we're not just competing with the TV station across town. We're competing with thousands of other apps, including the built-in weather app. And people say that the apps are accurate enough to be useful. And, you know, the thing is, we I, I think we can, can scoff at that and say, well, come on, surely it's not that accurate. We know where that information comes from. We're speaking as a meteorologist there. This is coming from the viewers. The consumers are saying the apps are accurate. And, and let's be honest, how many times has somebody come up to you and said, oh, I wish I had a job and I could still be wrong and get paid every day? They don't think we're accurate. So quit promoting, running all these promos to say, we're the most accurate forecast in town. Nobody believes that because they say the app, the app is just as accurate. So let's do something different. Let's promote that we're dependable. We help them plan their day in their neighborhood and we'll keep them safe during severe weather. So what do we do? Well, about three years ago, I, I introduced what I call the fundamentals of effective weather communication at the AMS broadcast conference. And there are three fundamentals. This takes kind of a holistic approach to the job of a broadcast meteorologist. So rather than checking the box off for mobile and doing a couple weather hits over here and making sure I got the, the, the social media updated, this kind of takes a step back and looks at what is it that we're trying to do? What is, a, what is our strategy here? Well, I think first and foremost, meteorology is number one. The forecast has to be right or nothing else we do matters. But it's more than just the forecast. It's being aware of how the weather impacts your local area. It also means being aware of how the science of meteorology is changing, knowing which channels on the GO satellite best depict fog so I can check for fog in the valleys, knowing uh, how to read dual pole Doppler data, even if you don't use it on the air to help you track severe weather, staying up to date on the latest forecast models, staying up to date on the science of meteorology, which by the way, attending the National Tropical Weather Conference is one of those ways to stay up to date on what's happening in terms of tropical weather. But meteorology, we've got to make sure that the forecast is right or nothing else matters. And then the edited version of that meteorology is what we share on TV, online, on mobile apps. This is what I call the essential message. It's the essential information. It's not everything that's going on in the weather. It's the essential information that viewers want to know and need to know about the weather right now. And keep in mind, the viewers don't necessarily know what they need to know. That's our job is to figure out what they need to know. But I call this the essential message. What are we trying to communicate? And then the way we package and present that weather information, I call that meteorology marketing. It's thinking of the information that we're sharing, the data we're sharing as a product. And how do we package and present that product on the various platforms and outlets we're using? Now, this is not about self-promotion. This is not about advertising. It's not about sponsorship. Meteorology marketing is not about the meteorologist. It's about the meteorology. It's how do we package and present that forecast information. And it needs to be different on every platform because the way it's consumed on every platform is different. I love this uh, definition from the American Marketing Association. Marketing is communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. Let me rephrase that for you. Meteorology marketing is communicating and delivering the essential information for our viewers and followers in society at large. Seth Godin, who's a marketing expert and business consultant writes, and I love this phrase, marketing is the generous act of helping others. I don't know about you, but I believe that we work in a service industry. Our jobs as broadcast meteorologists exist to serve our communities. We are in the service industry. Well, how we package and present that information, the marketing aspect of our what we do on the air and online and on social media, we are serving our viewers if we do it right. 
That's what meteorology marketing is all about. And the way that we do this on each of the platforms is different because the way it's consumed. Of course, Twitter's great for real-time updates. TikTok, well, that's the whole next generation. Facebook's good for long-form feature coverage. Instagram, visual weather coverage. Online and on-air are starting to kind of blend together because of OTT, over-the-top streaming platforms. On-demand weather is usually pre-recorded and played back live, but some some of us have the capability of doing that, uh, doing live coverage as well. And of course, on-air is usually live most of the time. But I want to focus a little bit more on what's happening on demand, online. And when I say online here, I'm referring specifically to the mobile app. But of course, this carries over to what we're doing on the website as well, because a lot of times the updates we record for one get shared on both platforms. But let's talk about some three things that you need to do to communicate more effectively, specifically for the mobile app. And number one, it's pretty simple. We got to recognize and prioritize the weather coverage online, on mobile, on OTT. This can't be something we just check off every day. All right, I got to do an update here. Let me record this and get it done. All right, send it off to the web team. I'm done. I've checked that box. We've got to prioritize the coverage. You've heard of digital first. Yeah, a lot of a lot of TV stations are pushing that, that we, we got to get our content out there early. If you're not pushing a forecast out there before you go on the air on TV, you run the risk of somebody looking at your weather coverage online and seeing old information. So what we're doing online, on mobile, on OTT, needs to be relevant and timely. And so there needs to be a strategy that your team, your whole weather team works together on. It needs to be a team effort. How do you cover the weather on mobile apps 24 seven, including the weekends? Then maximize the benefits of every platform. Take a good look at the weather app on your phone, your news app on your phone. What does it do well? How can you maximize the benefit of that platform? The information you present here may complement and supplement what you're actually getting on the weather app. The two should work together, what you do on the air and online. That's part of an extension of your coverage. It's not just something else. Is there some, is there some feature on the weather app that actually could help you communicate and connect with your audience that you're not currently optimizing? Can you go live on your weather app? Some apps allow you to go live. Can you put out specific uh, alerts and videos that only uh, go to a very small geographic area based on your uh, the clients that you're serving? If you work with, if you have the Max Engage, you can do that with the, a company or the uh, software from the weather company. But how can you maximize the benefits of the platforms you're on? And then finally, we got to make sure that we're delivering essential information every day on every platform that it can't just be more maps covered with numbers. It has to be essential information every day on every platform. And to me, I think that is how we differentiate our coverage here. I think that's how we differentiate our coverage, not only from our competition, but how we differentiate our coverage from what we're, what people can get on other apps, because we've got a video component here, right? But I also think that we have an opportunity as we go into tropical weather season, Apps right now don't do a very good job of delivering tropical weather information. You can get the track usually, and you can get some current stats and some forecast information, but they don't do a very good job of uh, giving the clarity and, the, and the, the background information and the information that people want to know and need to know about that tropical system. So you have an opportunity here to deliver essential tropical information as we now move into a more active part of the tropical season. So prioritizing your weather coverage, online, on mobile, on OTT, first establishing that this is a platform that we need to be active on, and then figuring out how to maximize the benefits of that platform and making sure that we're delivering essential information every day on every platform. That's how we compete on the mobile apps. It can't just be something we check off and do every day. So I ask you again, where are you right now? Are you aware that there's this mobile uh, community out there? Or are you kind of pushing back and saying, no, it's not me, not my market. I am I still hear from viewers all the time. They turn to me when, they, when severe weather hits. Great. Congratulations. I'm not going to disagree with you. But I will encourage you to go back and look at what your ratings were three years ago. There'll be a fraction of what they were three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The business has changed. I've been out of the business 
on the on-air side of the business for three years. And it's changed dramatically in those three years. We have TV stations now that are doing 24-7 OTT. The CBS stations, uh, own stations, all have a 24-7 news channel now. And it's not a rehash of the previous newscast. It's real new information that they're putting out there. We've got a whole new thing coming up in the next few years called Next Gen TV that's going to change the business again. And that's going to allow us to, to deliver information, the weather information, in ways that we've never been able to deliver. And I don't honestly completely understand it. I don't think most broadcasters do, but that technology is coming. And in terms of severe weather, some of the research that's being done right now at NSSL with the worn on forecast, that information is going to be made available within three to five years. I've been talking with some of the people that are working on that. So that information that worn on forecast is coming within three to five years. And because it's public information, it's weather service information, it won't be long, maybe six months, nine months after that, that it'll be available on a weather app. So again, the severe weather coverage goes back to the app. Where are you? Are you ahead of the game right now? Are you standing upright? Or are you still kind of operating knowing that the audience has gone to mobile and we're still working in a broadcast world? At least be the guy in the background there with his legs up. Do it with a little bit of style, right? I've been talking a lot about this online. Uh, this QR code takes you to the blog section of my, weather, uh, my website. And I've got a new article that's gonna be posted tomorrow that kind of talks about some of the things and same things we're talking about here. But this conversation actually started with that um, that uh, article on the bottom there. It says, weather apps are getting smarter and more useful. And I talked about how I was getting real-time updates on my phone and how apps are getting smarter. They're telling me to the minute when rain is going to start. And that was before I saw the research from the weather company. And it was interesting because I got some pushback from people. It said, yeah, but I do, be I do severe weather better. Uh, you know, no app is going to tell people that a tornado is coming. No, not yet but that's coming soon. That worn on forecast is certainly coming and the apps are getting smarter and more useful. I also refer to Bob Iger's book in another blog post that I wrote kind of as a follow-up, our meteorologist operating out of fear or courage. I was reading his book, uh, Ride of a Lifetime, in which he talks about leading the, the world's largest entertainment company, the Walt Disney Company. And as you might know, ABC 13, where I worked previously, was uh, owned by Disney. And Iger was at the TV station and was talking to us and talked about streaming and how important it was for us to be on the digital sphere. So this was something that was coming up from the, from the top. And as we know that that prediction came true, that people are turning to streaming platforms and mobile platforms. And the question that Iger posed in his book was that some TV stations were operating out of fear and not courage, knowing that the audience was shifting to mobile and streaming, but they were still kind of holding on to that, that broadcast uh, formula, that business formula. Uh, so I ask, are you operating out of fear or courage or ignorance that you're aware that the business is changing and that we need to be working in that that area and the mobile side? And then a few weeks after I wrote that article, uh, I got the research from the weather company that shows indeed that the preferred source of weather information is not local TV newscast. Kind of so a follow up to that um, it was interesting about three years ago, I did some work with Magid and they had showed some research and again, so this is like three years, was it 2008, 2019. And um, that at that point, they had surveyed the viewers and they talked about, you know, what is it about the local TV weathercast that bothers you or what needs to be fixed? And 81%, so eight out of 10 people said, my local broadcast meteorologist just covers information I already know. But nine out of 10, Nine out of 10 people said the weather coverage that I see on the air, on TV, it's the same on every channel. So you have a way, we, we have two problems, I think. We have to fix the what we're doing on TV, and we have to fix what we're doing on mobile as well. But the two have to work together. It needs to be an extension of the weather coverage you're doing, not just something else to do. That's Tim, good stuff, Tim. Alex? That, that's that's good stuff um, and, and fascinating. And it just keeps, those numbers keep skewing more and more and more toward the mobile side. You know, you've seen that whole thing shift so dramatically over the years. How much is too much on the app? How often can we send a push alert out? Yeah, I think you gotta be careful on push alerts because you run the risk of, of, uh, of hyping the weather. You also run the risk of over alerting to the people, you know, it's that people just get tired of them and turn them off. Um, I do want to say, you know, when I talk about, um, you know, having a very clear strategy, 
there's no such thing as a quiet weather day that if there's not severe weather, maybe there's something disruptive happening in your area. Maybe there's something inconvenient. It could be patchy fog, it could be light rain in the morning. If you got a teenage driver, light rain is a big problem for you because you're concerned about your teenage driver, especially your son that drives too fast, getting out there on the road to go to work. Um, there might be something optimal in the weather. I mean, let's. how many times do you get pictures of, of the sunset? Well, I tell you, if you issue a sunset warning, you're gonna get as many followers or, or much engagement as you do issuing a tornado warning. Give people a sunset warning, a rainbow warning. Believe it or not, that works. We did that all the time at ABC 13. Uh, and there might be something unusual happening in the weather. Uh, but looking for those types of opportunities. We're not hyping the weather. We're highlighting the weather that the viewers are concerned about. But I do think that you got to be careful on some of those push alerts and pushing out too much information. Or not pushing out too much information, but, but uh, pushing out too many times to the viewer and interrupting their day. Yeah, I think that's that's it's got to be something that's halfway important at least. And and the other issue then is okay, our app, we believe our app is the best, you know, and we've got a lot of great information there and and we go in and massage the numbers. We you know, it, it preloads of course with with whatever a lot of apps just use what it preloads with, but we go in every day and change the numbers by one or two and move them around and do what we really think is best. But how do you convince viewers that that your app is the best? That that yours is doing more than all the others that that it, it, it's uh, accurate enough to be useful mm -hmm. um we want it to be more accurate you know well i don't think you can win on the accuracy part i just don't think you can that that you know whether our app shows 92 degrees or 94 degrees it's going to be in the 90s today i get that and 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 i go back to the statement i said earlier was that people think that we're inaccurate but your app does something that the built-in weather app doesn't do and this gets back to maximizing you know, the, the, the resources, the platform, you have a video section. And I can't tell you how many times I go to a station's uh, uh, app and I click on the video and it's a clip of the last newscast weathercast, which was old before it even reached the server. So you're telling me what the current conditions were and the current wind pattern was at six o'clock this morning. I'm looking at the app at 10 a.m. I want to see information that I can use right now. And so you're going to be very strategic in terms of the content that you're putting on that app, which is why this can't just be something you record and send, you know, and upload to the website. You have to think about what can I put on the app that will be timely and relevant no matter when somebody clicks play until we update the app again, which is why the whole team has to be involved. There has to be a schedule. There has to be a strategy that it can't just be something else that we're going to do today and a rehash of the last weathercast. So that video is where you separate yourself. That's how you differentiate your coverage. It's not going to be in the, you know, great. I like that you're spending a lot of time forecasting the numbers and massaging those numbers. But at the end of the day, how much are you changing them? Maybe one or two degrees, you know? Let's let's spend our time, maybe a little less time on Facebook and Twitter, and maybe a little bit more time trying to get that uh, the, the video to be a little bit more relevant. So that's good. I want to get Hal back in here in just a second. I'm going to ask one more question, then Hal jump in. But so you think about it. You know, we're in a TV studio, and we've got lights and cameras and chairs yeah. and, and big desks and fancy stuff, and all those lights come on for a newscast. But we do a web video for the app. We're using this camera right here that way, right you know right. and you whatever the background is behind it not particularly well lit there's a little ring camera you know and and you show a couple of maps in the video you know does that does that video need more production value does it need to be something that's more than just shot with that camera so you're going to get a, a personal taste and this is just my personal taste we are professional meteorologists so we should look professional as much as possible and so if you have the ability to um to, to have the whole studio lit up and you're in front of your video wall, or you're in front of your chroma key and you can fire these off. Yeah. There's a little bit of a learning curve for everybody involved, but once you get the schedule set, it becomes just a standard thing. Okay. It's time to do the web update and it needs to be part of that schedule, right? It needs to be treated with just as much as importance as the newscast are ready to, to put on the air. But I believe that the more professional you can look, the better it looks. I, you know, I cringe. In fact, I don't even watch videos where it looks like they're broadcasting from a closet with a, a webcam and their face is pink because the color's off and the video sounds like crap. I mean, that to me, it, you know, when I'm I'm coaching my clients, I I talk about the you know everything sends a message there. It's all part of the package. It's all part of the marketing. And we got to present ourselves as being serious professional meteorologists. So my personal taste is, yeah, you make it look as good as possible. I'll jump in. Go ahead, because I know you've got questions over there. 
Yeah, it's some very thought-provoking stuff. This is a great presentation. Wh what about the audience's desire nowadays to be interactive? Things like, you know, Facebook shifted to Facebook Live where people can ask questions in real time. Do you, do you see more and more of a desire for people to have interaction with their meteorologist as well, or not necessarily so much? You know, I think that I don't have any numbers on that in terms of, you know, the um, desirability of it. Uh, Facebook continues to be the predominant uh, social media. This There's some other parts of this research where they looked at, well, if you're on social media, which platform? And Facebook by far is still the most popular. Um, but I'd like to see the demographics on that, too. You know, is it is it is that my mom's on Facebook, but I'm not necessarily that active on it anymore. My kids certainly aren't. And that's the next generation of TV viewers. Um, so, you know, there are some opportunities, I think, to be interactive as well on the mobile apps. If you're doing live updates, you know, you can ask people to send in some eyewitness weather reports from wherever they are. Uh, a lot of apps have the ability to click a button and send a picture right to the weather, to the to the TV station. Um, I think the apps in some cases need to kind of catch up to us as well. There's just, there, admittedly, there's just something that we can't control in the weather office. There's only so much we can do if the app doesn't do live weather updates. We can't do that. But let's look at what we can do. What can we do? Well, we got video updates. Let's make sure that those updates are timely. There's a reason why the weather company's Max Engage system makes you cut out your update at one minute because the research shows that people watch for 30 to 45 seconds. They're not watching a two to three minute weather cast. And, uh, and so we've got to, we, you know, shorter, concise is better, but do more of them. Do multiples. Maybe do one that just talks about the weather today and another one that talks about the weather this weekend and another video that talks about the big picture, the what's coming up next. Well, that's three pre-rolls. Your sales department will love that. And that packages the weather a little bit differently too. Tim, another question. In weather inherently is probabilistic, right? So on a given day, we might think, by late afternoon, we're going to have more moisture streaming into the area, a higher chance of rain later afternoon. I'll talk to friends and family sometimes, and they'll say, oh, it's supposed to start raining at 324. I cringe. I'm like, that's that's not the how, how it works, right? Nobody can pinpoint right. that to the minute six hours out. That said, when I get in the car and I drive to see my kids in, in DFW from Galveston, my app says I'm going to arrive at 1129 AM. I never I never turn the thing thing down or throw my phone away. I feel like okay, that that's a that's an estimation. It it like you said before, maybe it's accurate enough to be useful. I don't turn the thing off because it's giving me a specific minute. I kind of know it probably won't be exactly eleven twenty nine, but it it gives me an idea. What are your thoughts on this? The pinpointing to the minute, like some of these apps do. How do you work with that? How do you how do you maybe use that or help uh, massage those numbers or help people understand most accurately what they're looking at as they plan the day? You know, I think I'm going to go back to the first part of what you said there. And that it, that was the description of what was going on in the weather. I mean, that's something that the app can't do. Explain to me that moisture levels are coming up, that the chances of rain are going to increase in the afternoon. It, it, it means that we need to take a little bit of time and look at what our own app is showing so that the content that we're putting on the mobile app and that video section relates to what that app is showing. Yeah, it's. It, I, I think people kind of know that the numbers are going to change as the weather changes. Even in terms of the long range forecast, I remember many years ago, we did some research and um, and it showed that people didn't care. It, it, that people accepted the fact that the forecast is gonna change, which I thought was interesting that we, and this was looking back at, should we do a seven day or a 10 day forecast? People still wanted to know that there was a chance of rain 10 days from now, they still wanted to know. And even, and, and they accepted the fact that it might change, that it might not rain on that 10th day, but I still want to know that there's a small chance. And I think that kind of goes back to the accuracy of the apps and say, okay, well, you know, the rain chance drops down to 12% at 4 p.m., but at least it's it's not as high as 62% at 3 p.m. or 2 p.m., you know? So we kind of know that, I think that, and, and I have no science to back this up, I just, my own personal experience is that we're kind of looking more general at the numbers. And I think as a meteorologist, we're looking specifically, but I think the viewer looks at them more generally. Again, I don't have research to back that up, just my own personal uh, impression of those. Yeah, that is very thought provoking and interesting just to think about, there's a lot of cognitive science behind this. How are people thinking? Sometimes people, is it gonna be raining for my golf outing on, you know, yes or no? Sometimes it gets binary with people. Right. It'll be raining for my daughter's wedding on Saturday, right? It, yes or no, it, but it's really probabilistic, right? It is, it is, but I think that people kind of, you know, 
they listen, they've been watching us for decades and, you know, and, and our forecasts have, have gotten a little bit better, I think, over the t- that time, um, you know, that we're being a little bit more specific. We can actually track storms down now to a, a city street and give you an, an, an estimated time of arrival to the minute on TV. Well, some of that technology has now gone over to the app and it's accurate enough to be useful. And so that's why people are there, which is why we need to be there as well. That's why I say we can't we have we play in this space. But we're not doing a very good job of playing in that space. We're not doing a very good job of prioritizing the mobile app that I think that we need to be, we do we need to be doing. And great discussion, Tim. Tim Smith, do we have any questions that have come in from online? We do. We've got a couple of questions coming in online. Let me very quickly just say thank you to our sponsors, our mid-break here. Uh, USAA, the South Padre Island Convention and Visitors Bureau, the weather company, the city of Brownsville, Weather Boy, Walmart, the Port of Brownsville, and Black Magic Design. All some of the folks that help make these uh, webinars every week a possibility. So thanks to all of them. We hope we will see all of you live in person to South Padre Island next April for the uh, National Tropical Weather Conference. Um, RJ is asking, uh, have TV companies considered partnering with some of these fast-moving and accurate weather apps well the i know in a, in a, some tv stations have, de, have developed their own uh i know the grand media group because i work do some work with uh, one of their stations that they've got their own app and it allows them to go live uh which is a pretty cool feature uh, but a lot of tv stations are are you know will partner with like the weather company has an app and the, the guts of that the main background component you know, comes from the weather company and then the local TV stations input their, can massage the forecast based on what they think is going to happen, but then they add their own video component. And so it's really the video component I'm speaking to more here and that that's what we got to fix that we're rather than spending 20 minutes massaging the numbers there in your grid, spend 20 minutes structuring that weather hit so that it's relevant and timely information for the viewer when they click play. On so much, we talk about apps, but so much, of course, weather information in general is coming off the phone now, you know, and, and whether it's an app or a website that people go to. And um, week before Labor Day, I get a text from a good friend. He goes, hey, there's a, a website. This guy knows what he's talking about. And he says there's going to be 80 mile per hour winds on South Padre Island on Labor Day because a hurricane's coming. And, of course, he was looking at the model cane that the GFS was putting out there 10 days in advance. And how do you convince people that – that you've got to know your source, you know, you've got it. You've got it. You know, just because there's one guy put that 10 day GFS out there, how do you convince them that, that, you know, and it, it's happening again today with, with what is now, by the way, tropical depression number seven. So I think that we have to be part of that conversation that's out there. And you, you know, it's, it means that you're not doing a quick one minute hit and sending it up to your app, but maybe you're doing a, a second hit that gets into a little bit more detail just on the tropical weather. Yeah, I know it requires more time that you've got to set up, but um, you know, are you doing tropical updates several times a day that you're part of that conversation and sharing your expertise so that it's not just, here's the latest track, here are the forecast models, here are the spaghetti models, but get into the nitty gritty, share your expertise. Look at what, what Levi does on tropical tidbits. I mean, it's, he doesn't, very rarely we'll show you the forecast track. It's all of the stuff and what he does with the satellite and the radar. And it is good TV. It's on my computer screen, but it's great TV. He gets into the nitty gritty of that. I remember that that was one of the things with Dr. Neil Frank. When I first started here in Houston, I, I studied him because I'm competing against the former director of the National Hurricane Center. I thought, what is he doing that I'm not doing? Because if I talked about the, I had the track and the models and I, you know, I was pushing all this data out there. And then I watched Dr. Neal's uh, forecast, and he would stand there on the satellite and point out the small cumulus clouds feeding in the moisture and look at the upper level blow off here. And he was sharing his expertise. And I'm like, that's it. That's that's what we need to be doing. You know, it's 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 very easy to stand in front of a map and recite numbers. And here's your forecast data. And here's the forecast track. And here's your extended forecast. It's not so easy to get into the nitty gritty and to share your expertise, which by the way, also shares your personality, which strengthens your bond with your viewer. But I think you've got to be part of the conversation. If there's a, a model showing a storm out there, do a tropical update in which you acknowledge that, you know, there's some models that are showing a storm. Here's why I don't think this is going to be something for us to worry about yet. I think that's a, that's a great point. It's, you don't, you don't maintain radio silence on it. You, you, right. 
you know, uh, and we're always afraid to put something like that out there just because somebody's going to grab it, a screenshot of it and say, look what they said, even though you're not hearing what we say, just look, look what then it, it just doesn't happen that way. But, but that's a good, that's a good point. And you can't necessarily do all of that on live TV because we got two and a half minutes if you're lucky <laughs> and uh, you know, two and a half, maybe three minutes if you're really lucky. Uh, and so, you know, the, so what you do on live TV has got to be different. Obviously it has to feed the masses there, but it still has to deliver essential information, but there is no time limit on digital. You know, you could talk forever. Um, you know, I don't recommend it unless you've got active weather, but there's nothing wrong with you doing multiple videos and some of them being a little bit longer that get into the nitty gritty of your expertise. I mean, think back to that research. One of the things that people said is that the explanations are confusing. All right, well, spend some time going into the explanation so that they're not as confusing. So where are we headed? What's the future of apps? I mean, it looks like this is, we're going down this direction of more and more video, but what's the direction? So I have a, I have a prediction for you that okay. I think within five years, maybe three years, that we will have the ability to create an, a, an avatar of ourselves that will handle some of the social media and the digital content for us, specifically with severe weather, that we will be, that much like we have uh, apps right now will automatically post severe weather alerts and they run an animation that there will be an avatar version of us and we can title it appropriately that will be tim smith delivering me a tornado warning and it will look pretty much like you it will be pretty close to what you look like and and i think some of that's going to be driven by artificial intelligence and i think that ai eventually will get into some of the the um even the, the production of what we do that artificial intelligence will look at the forecast will look at what's happening and you'll come in and sit down in front of your workstation and your hits will already be laid out for you that artificial intelligence will have suggested well you know what fog is a problem this morning let's put in the visibility let's put in the fog cast let's put in the um you know we'll populate your shows based on what's going on in the forecast and then you have ultimate choice but i think ai and avatars are going to be the two things that will that will be the next generation of weather coverage. And some Avatars. of that some of that technology is there now. It's just getting it over into the weather system. Oh, well, we've got it on our phones already. You know, you can yeah. you can do that right now. That's fascinating. What a, what, a, what an interesting idea. I like that concept. Um, well, good question coming scary, in though. from- uh, It's scary too. <laughs> it, it is, it is, exactly. Um, Sean's got a good question. He says, what's the research say about TikTok other than it's used by younger generations? That's what it says. That it is, it is, in fact, I just read an article today that it is the new Google, that people are going to TikTok and searching for things on TikTok as opposed to going to Google, but it is your younger generation. Listen, I mentioned all of those social media outlets. I'm not suggesting you be active on TikTok and social media and, and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I tell my clients, listen, if you're going to be active on social media, be active, but it needs to be, you have to go all in. You can't just be doing it every once in a while. You got to be all in. So if you're going to be on TikTok, go all in on TikTok. If you're not going to be, then don't do it. Um, Facebook is still the predominant number one social media platform, but I'm going to go back to that research that shows only 12% of people prefer getting updates on social media. And what have we been doing? We've been spending all this time trying to build our following on social media. Every client I work with, that's one of the things that, that, that almost every client, they say, you know, I need some better social media strategies. And my question to them is why? What are you doing on mobile? Let's start with, let's fix the mobile problem first, and then we'll worry about social media. More good questions coming in. This one from Weatherzog says, what are your preferred strategies for dedicating more time from a local TV broadcast weather team to digital and streaming? Uh, give that to me again, dedicating more time to the on-air broadcast or digital? From dedicating more time from a local TV broadcast weather team over to digital and streaming. What what are the strategies, preferred strategies for, for taking that time that we put on television and moving it over to digital? I think you got to produce something completely different. I think it needs to be, you got to look at your audience, uh, look at the needs of the audience, which changes throughout the day. And you got to focus on what those people are actually getting um, or what those people actually need in that part of the day. Uh, I, I, right now I'm coaching about 30, I think it's 32 is the current number, 32 broadcast meteorologists. And we talk about a couple of things. We talk about what is the station slogan? You know, if you're the weather authority or if you're the first alert, whatever, but how are you building that brand and how are you communicating that? How are you demonstrating your brand every single day? And I don't think you necessarily need more time on TV. In fact, my 
uh, almost every time I see like a three minute weather cast, I'm bored about three quarters of the way in and I'll pause the tape and say, okay, I'm ready for the forecast. Give it to me. So I don't think we need more time on TV. I think we need more time on, on digital. I think we need more time on mobile apps. And this kind of follows up on that. This is Lance saying, first of all, he says, great presentation. He says, how do we convince the station management then to dedicate more resources and people who can curate mobile video content? Yeah, good luck. Um, it's yeah. always, right, it's always more with less. I think that um, part of the prioritizing the mobile coverage is going to require a, an analysis of our own personal workflow. I, you know, good luck if you can get the station to hire a digital meteorologist to to do some of this. I think it's it's going to come down to us. What can we control though? So we got to look at our own personal workflow. What part of my workflow can I change? Maybe I spend a little less time tweeting and maybe a little bit more time focused on a, a strategy for mobile coverage. And, and by the way, once you do that, once you figure out what your strategy is and what the what the uh, techniques are that you're going to do to to accomplish that strategy. It becomes a little bit easier because you just kind of you get into the routine every day of doing uh, of you know having a specific type of mobile weather update that you're going to do. Um, you know, is it going to be content that supplements and complements what you're doing on the air? Are the things that you can pre-record on a sunny day that you can then filter in on on a stormy day that are ready to go? Uh, an explanation of what a watch warning is. Have that video ready to go. And so when you got severe weather, that becomes a video that gets shoved up to the top. So your app doesn't just have today's forecast. It has a list of, of relevant content that the viewers can can click play on. The questions are just pouring in. So I love this. This is as, okay. as many as we've had in a while. So let me keep them coming here. Um, Casper wants to know if you have any recommendations for any particular apps that are incorporating these things that you're talking about. You know, i um, I think I think the weather companies engage is a um, the stations that are using that as the backbone. I think that's uh, what I really like about that. And and full disclosure, I am a I, I do have a business partnership with the weather company. That aside, the part of it that I like, and is that you can geolocate some of the videos so that you can produce a video specifically for Reliant Stadium. I can produce a, a video specifically for people that are at a local festival. I can draw it on a map and say, here, send this update to this festival, the people that are in this area, because the storm's coming in. So I like the fact that you can you can geolocate some of these warnings. And I think that's that's another thing that the built-in weather app can't do, but we can. That's cool. Nathan says, great talk, Tim. With the emergence of these weather apps, should we be discussing the basics of how these models work? How do these models work as a digital or social media feature? That way people can be better informed weather consumers. I think so. I think that um, that's part of the conversation that you can have with consumers. I mean, there's nothing wrong with you on the air saying, listen, the app shows that there's a 20% chance of rain today. Let me explain that. And I guarantee that if you do that for two, two and a half minutes, if you get into the nitty gritty, that's a much more interesting weather cast than you standing there giving me a bunch of uh, numbers. Get into the science. Why? What's going on in the app here? Why is it showing 20%? Why it actually could be a little too low or too high based on your experience? And take a piece of that, record it, and stick it on the app in the video part of it. Get into your, uh, share your process with the viewers. That's that's good. And it comes back to the thing we talked about of how we're using this little camera to do all the weather app stuff, but a whole studio to do the TV stuff and, mm -hmm. and the and then the, the priority. How do you have any more questions over there? We've still got more coming in online, but but you're sitting quietly and patiently, and I appreciate that. Yeah, Tim, you had mentioned, you know, an app that has a video loaded. It's 10 a.m., and the latest video update was from 6 a.m., and the concern of that delay. So do a lot of these apps have videos, and is the big picture there if you're going to have videos to make sure they're very current? Almost all of them will have a video component. Um except for that built-in weather app that comes in, you know, it's built into your iPhone or your Android phone. Um, and that's, to me, that's where you can differentiate your coverage on your app from the built-in app, that you're giving people a little bit more clarity. But you got to be careful there that you're not showing them old information. So, the, you know, one of the, the strategies I work with with TV stations is saying, okay, we're updating at 4 a.m. What are we going to put in that app that's still relevant all the way through 10 a.m., which is when the next update gets recorded? So it's it's figuring out first of all what your recording schedule is and then figuring out from there what are we going to put in that app or what are we going to put in the webcast that stays relevant for that time period and a lot of it is future forecasting it's always going ahead to the next uh the next period of time and focusing on that so that way the information is always 
looking ahead, not looking back, and certainly not looking at what it is right now. You should never have current conditions on your weather forecast or on your online weather app. That's that's old. Tim, how perishable are forecasts and videos, or does that depend on the weather for the day? Oh, it depends on the weather for the day. I mean, yeah, I think you've got to have a regular schedule. And then, you know, obviously, as the weather changes, you need to be updating that, um, you know, in real time, if possible, or at least a little bit more current currently, or if you're in a situation where you're working alone, and I know this is true of a lot of broadcast meteorologists, you're the only one there, especially in the weekends, you're all by yourself, and you've got severe weather developing, at least on the weather app, make sure you talk about the threat of severe weather and tune in to channel whatever, whatever. We'll keep you updated on the air as storms develop. We've also got push alerts that will set, let you. You can also check the radar here on our app. Keep them engaged with your app and your weather coverage. But you can do you can do a generalized uh, a weather update if you're the only one on the team that day that keeps people connected with you. But the last thing that they should find out, was especially severe weather, and, and I got to be honest, I mean, some of the Houston TV stations need to do a better job of this. I'll have severe weather going on in my backyard, thunder and lightning, and I go to the weather app and I see a forecast that was recorded at nine o'clock this morning. That's not helpful. So it's really outdated. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, are, are there certain words you like to use that are less perishable? Like, for example, recently we've had more moisture coming in as opposed to at 10 a.m. The, the OB showed more moisture coming in or something like that. Are there are there words or phrases you like to use that maybe last a little bit longer? I, I think some of that depends on your the personality that you're sharing with viewers. Um, I'll use James Spann as an example. I mean, James Spann could probably go on the air and talk about precipitable water and people would eat it up. I'm not sure that when I was on the air, I could talk about precipitable water and people would understand what I was talking about. I, you know, I called it tropical moisture. Um, you know, some of it depends on the personality of the meteorologist and what you can get away with. But I, I don't have a problem sharing, you know, terminology, meteorolo meteorological terminology with viewers, provided that we explain what it is. But we can't just throw it out, you know. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I cringe when I see a TV station. I've seen this where they show the upper air and it says 500 millibar heights. What? What? <laughs> yeah. Right. People, just, most people just wouldn't know what that means unless no. the meteorologist explains it. Yeah. Right. Great content, Tim. Tim Smith, back to you. Any other questions coming in from online? We do have another one. It kind of goes back to a question how that you asked earlier. And Tim, you commented on a little bit about how, how accurate enough to be useful. Um, Kylie wants to know if would language like the rain will start between 315 and 330 be better than the rain's going to start at 324. Well, you got to remember, too, that the apps are they're universal. So your viewers are going to be could be anywhere in your market, could even be out of your market and watching. And I think that's, you know, kind of circling back to the whole tropical weather. I mean, that's the, the advantage of, you know, people that are vacationing in Colorado, but still want to know what's going on in their, their backyard with the weather. So I think you got to be careful in your terminology. Let the app do offer the specificity to viewers. Keep your, in the video part, as generalized as possible so that it fits the most most people that you talk about the threat of severe weather this afternoon or maybe even you could get as specific as saying you know after 3 p.m we have to worry about chance of storms i think a lot of times the the real one of the benefits too is that um you see a severe system along a major highway it's a holiday weekend and you can do a push alert to you can geofence it to people that are driving down that highway so yeah. they're driving down that highway and hey hey look you know you're gonna hit some severe storms in about an hour um you know wherever you are on that highway they're in ahead of you i think there's a great opportunity there as well but i think that the artificial intelligence eventually will get to the point where we don't even have to worry about the geolocating that the computer will take care of that for us and will automatically identify the area draw it out for you and you can click approve or not fudge it but it, it'll save time on your end so I, I guess i'm hoping that as more gets put on our shoulders that ai will take care of some of the uh you know the, the stuff that we do listen my my whole goal with everything that i do is to get meteorologists broadcast meteorologists to think more deliberately about everything that they do that every color choice that we make for every graphic, getting back to a presentation I did last year, to the content we're putting on air and on mobile, that what we're putting on social media, that they're deliberate choices. It's not just part of our workday, that we have a strategy and 
uh, you know, that we're trying to accomplish something with every action. Otherwise, we're just going through the motion. And we, you know, we, we've got to we've got to serve our community. And the best way we can serve that community is by making deliberate choices on our end that serve our community. And when they tune into us. Terrific insight, Tim. Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, all your thoughts today and all the work that you're doing to help make what we do in our business a little bit better each and every day. So Thank we appreciate that. Me. Hal, any final thoughts? Yeah, one last question for you, Tim. What about extended forecasts, especially with tropical? We know that as we go out in time, the models become less accurate. And it, it, Tim, you mentioned a a ten day model snapshot that someone was showing. What what are your how do you handle these longer range type of uh, model snapshots? Do you talk about them? Do you do you again try to explain and, and walk people through it? I think if it's if I mean people have access to the models, they have access to some of these social meteorologists that are putting out videos on YouTube that are going you know get millions of views that talk about a storm that may or may not develop, and there's nothing wrong with you saying here's what I'm watching. You know I've got there's several things I'm watching. Um, you know, American model shows potential storm, not buying it yet. I mean, share that, share your expertise with the viewers. I think that's how you do it. But you, uh, radio silence, as Tim said a little bit ago, is not the answer. Ignoring what's out there is not the answer. We have to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Great stuff, Tim. Thank you for having me. Tim, really appreciate it. What a great program today. Great information, very useful to all of us in the business and hopefully those who are uh, on the on the on the fringe looking in and seeing what we're doing. And thanks to all the viewers who've been watching and asking questions today as well. It's been a great program. Thank you, Tim. Really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Good stuff. We want to thank, as always, our sponsors who make these a possibility. Once again, uh, thanks to USAA. USAA has been a part of the National Tropical Weather Conference from the very beginning, and we appreciate their support over and over again. The South Padre Island Convention and Visitors Bureau, we hope to see all of you there live in person in April of 2023. We'll be at the Marriott Courtyard Hotel in beautiful South Padre Island. So please join us for that. The Weather Company, the City of Brownsville, Weatherboy, Walmart, the Port of Brownsville, Black Magic Design, all the folks who make these events a possibility. And by the way, yes, that invest did become tropical depression number seven about 10 seconds after we said it was an invest. So uh, that's the way that usually works. So if we <laughs> click refresh one more time, we'd have had it for you. So it's there. So Dr. Hal Needham, thank you. Appreciate your presence as always. And your great questions and your insight as well. Good job, Hal. Great job, everybody. Really enjoyed the uh, the the video today. Great job, Tim. Thank you. Tim, nice job. Next week, by the way, we've got um, Stephanie Murphy, who's the Vice President of Preparedness, Resilience, and Emergency Management for Tidal Basin. That's coming up next Wednesday. That's the 21st uh, at 10 a.m. So until then, have a great week. Stay safe out there. Bye-bye.